Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our Facts Matters webinar series. Um, I'm Karen Ursland. I am part of our clinical applications group here at BD. Last time, we started this webinar series with a talk on compensation basics, where we gained a deeper understanding of what compensation really is and the impact it has on data analysis and quality. So today, we'll continue on with that topic by diving deeper into how proper panel design with consideration of your biology and fluorocomb choices can really affect the resolution of those populations of interest. So if you missed that first webinar, you can find it um, at bdbiosciences.com under the webinar section. And today, Dr. Alan Stahl will continue our webinar. Um, he is a principal scientist in the R&D department here at BD. He has been the R&D lead for the teams that really developed the cytometry setup um, tracking system that's incorporated in those CS and T deeds that's part of the FACS-DIVA and FACS-Suite software that a lot of you use. So since 2011, Alan has focused on expanding the potential of multicolor flow cytometry through developing new colors, software creation, and teaching tools to enable scientists to design better complex multicolor panels. So Alan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody, for this second uh, webinar. Today we're going to be uh, making practical use of what we learned in the last webinar. In particular, we're going to focus on how the concept of spread impacts resolution, which we'll get into panel design, how to quantify the impact of spread of resolution, in other words, so to actually have numbers that we can think about and utilize, and then how to utilize this information on spillover spread to improve panel design. We'll talk about the use of fluorescent minus one controls and then maximizing population resolution by minimizing spillover induced spread. And then we'll talk about how to recognize compensation errors in multicolor assays. So just to review some of the major take home messages that we had in part one, the first was, as we've mentioned, fluorescent spillover induces a spread into an assay, and we'll talk about that even more today. The spillover can come from many sources, intra and cross laser, and fluorochromes can show multiple types of spillover, so different aspects of the fluorochromes characteristics can contribute to the amount of spillover it shows. The other thing we talked about, and we'll see even more so today, is the classic spillover values that we all are familiar with are in fact not the best measure of the amount of spread. So we still use them and people uh, have them on their machines, but I want to introduce you to other ways of thinking about spread. The proper selection and use of compensation controls is critical to accurately correcting for spillover. And we talked about the fact that the amount of accuracy that you need is in fact dependent upon the requirements of your assay. And last, when looking at compensated multicolor data, it really is best to use uh, contour plots with bi-exponential axes. So now we're going to turn to the concept of the relationship between spillover, spread, and resolution. And this is going to be core to all everything that we talk about in this webinar. So just to go back over what we talked about last time, on the left panel what we can see is uh, CD4 per CP sci 5.5 and we can see the spillover into the PE Psi 7 detector. After you've uh, finished compensation using your compensation controls and you've applied the matrix to your data, you can see data that looks like the right-hand panel. And what you can see, as we talked about last time, is the compensation removes the background in the PE Psi 7 detector, but it does not remove the spread that is there. And it is this spread that will cause lower resolution in the spillover detector. So when I talk about the spillover detector in this example, for example, that would be the PE Psi 7 detector. So it's under, important to understand the relationship between the dyes, the fluorochromes, and anakin density. And what we can see here is the amount of spread that you get is proportional to the amount of spillover. So here we see a case where we're looking at spillover of 9.15% uh, of PE Psi 5 into PE, 
Here we're looking at spillover of 50, which is only 0.86. And you can see that basically it looks like an ice cream cone with uh, seven scoops just laid one on top of another, and there is really no increase in spread. And here we take another case of PE, CF594 going to PE, which has a relatively high spillover value, and you can see how much spread we have. And in particular, notice, again, we're using a bi-exponential scale, and this scale is such that the bottom end of the scale is minus 2,500. So the spread that you're seeing on the red population is going from effectively minus 2,500 to positive 2,500. So it's very, very large. The bi-exponential scale can make things look more compact than they really are. So the amount of spread is, as we said, proportional to the amount of spillover, but it's also related to reagent brightness. So here we see the reagent brightness in the uh, uh, PE detector, or excuse me, in the, in the PECF is 7,000. Here it's 1,500, so the spread is much less uh, in the PE detector. Here it is, uh, uh, excuse me, much less in the PECF 594 detector. Uh, here it's very low, and then we go to the opposite case where the uh, PE level is at 35,000. 35, you can see the amount of spread in the PECF 594 detector. Now, I won't go into it today, but the reagent brightness is going to be a function both of the antigen density on the population that you're looking at and the fluorochrome brightness. But when you're thinking of spread, you can really just think, it, think of it as the total uh, reagent brightness that we're dealing with. So why does this matter? Well, in this cartoon, what we can see is that if we're looking at a secondary population here, this one would now be uh, PECF 594 dim PE negative. If it has more PE on it, so now it's a double positive population, here we can still resolve these two populations, so the black population and the blue population, you'd be able to put easy gates around it. Now we're at a point where the populations are beginning to overlap. You can sort of resolve them, but not very well. And in the worst case scenario here, these two populations are now completely unresolvable. So that you can see the spread is impacting our ability to resolve a double pop positive population. And that's going to be the concept we're going to follow today. Now, we talk about double positive, but when you're thinking about a multicolor uh, system, you may have triple positive or even quadruple positive, so you have to start thinking about them. But the same way that we look at fluorescence, we tend to look at, at two-dimensional dot plots or two-dimensional plots. It's best to think about this in terms of two dimensions. So what can we do? Well, if we wanted to resolve that population, then we might have to pick a different color to bring the, the black population further away from the highly spread red population. So one question that came up uh, after the last seminar and is a really important point because people think uh, I can just change my uh, voltage because what people know is that if you change your voltage, you can change your spillover values. And this is part of the reason I say that spillover values are not meaningful in terms of understanding spread. So what you can see in this example is at a reference voltage, we're seeing a spillover value of 165%, which is still very high. But we can either lower the voltage, in which case the spillover value goes up to 800%, or, lower the, uh, or, or raise the voltage, in which the spillover value goes down to 44%. So most people would be semi-comfortable with 44%, and 825% spillover value would be considered quite outrageous. But what you can see in terms of the actual spillover of the one reagent into the other, it's completely unaffected by the differences in the PMT voltages. So the spillover value is not telling you anything about the amount of spread. It's just telling you something relative to how you've set up your PMTs. So let's now, now that we understand uh, the, rel the relationship between spillover and spread and its impact on resolution, let's see how we can quantify this. And what we're going to talk about is the metrics that we've developed here at BD called the resolution impact matrix. There are other metrics that are out there 
that have their, each has their sort of unique value and way of using it. One is not inherently better than the other. Another major uh, approach is that developed by Mario Roederer and is currently implemented in Flojo, and that's the spillover spread matrix. They work slightly differently, but the concept is essentially identical. So think of it this way. Think of two colors we have, fluorescence A and fluorescence B. And we can look at single positive stains. We we're going to use CD4 here. And we can look at the, the spillover, what we call the single positive spillover, a single, excuse me, single positive stain index. And we talked about the stain index in the last lecture. So basically it's the difference between the positives and the negatives divided by two times the RSD of the negatives. And we can look at that in either dimension, either in the fluorescence A or the fluorescence B. But from this data, we can actually calculate and determine a theoretical double, pop, double positive population. And that's shown in green. And basically, that double positive population is what you would see if you were looking at cells that were expressing two antigens of essentially equal density, equal fluorescence intensity, and you're looking at the intersection. And those are your double positives. So we can talk about the double positives, A positive, B positive, and compare it to either the A positive single stain or the B positive single stain. So again, here's the metric we're using for uh, the single positive, but now we go to the double positive, and instead what we're going to be using is, again, the difference in the MFI of the uh, double positive population in green minus the MFI of the single positive population in red, but now we're going to divide it by the RSD of the single positive population, which has a lot of spread associated in it. So similarly, the resolution of the green cells from the blue single positives is essentially the same type of a calculation. And from this, we get a, what we call a double positive stain index table, which is shown here. Uh, online, we will be providing examples of this for, for a lyric. But what you can see is on the diagonal, uh, we are showing the single positive stain index for each color. So for example, BV421 has a single positive stain index of about 1,300 on this instrument. V500 has a single positive stain index of 52. But on every other uh, cell, what we're showing you is the double positive stain index of two, two markers showing the same intensity in which the resolution is being impacted by the second marker. So you can see here that the BB786, we have a stain index that went from 1300 now to a double positive stain index, which is only 90. So we've lost a lot of our resolution. So we'll talk about this more in the coming slides. So when we think of loss of resolution, this is the type of uh, diagram I like to show, which is on the left-hand side, we're looking at the single positive stain index of CD4, of the CDA, I'm calling it, uh, in the PECF594. And if we do that calculation, we get a stain index of 700. If we now look at the double positive population, the A positive, B positive, and now compare it to the A positive, A negative, B positive population, we can see that the double positive stain index has now decreased to 50. So that loss of going from a, a resolution of 700 to a loss uh, to a resolution of 50 that is your loss of resolution. So we can calculate that for any combination of two dyes, assuming the same uh, fluorescence intensity. So in this slide, we're looking at a resolution impact matrix, what we call the RIM. And again, on the diagonal, any dye with the same dye is, is, doesn't have meaning, therefore the value is zero. But what we can see here is, let's take a look at the column labeled 50. So if we have 50 on one marker, and we were to co-express uh, uh, with the same antigen density, PE, 
what you can see is that we'll lose 10% of the signal. And that we know inherently is also, you know, these are the dyes we've been using for 40 years together. Uh, and we know that 50 has, uh, or PE has very, very little impact on 50. And in fact, the other dyes have zero impact. But what we can see here is, let's, let's take a look at the Percy P column, Percy P sci 5.5 column. And what you can see is that 50 will cause a 44% reduction in the stain index, PE an 89%, PE size 7, 54%, and the red dyes as expected have very little impact. So what we're beginning to get is an idea of if I add this dye with dye number one with dye number two and it's on a co-expressed population, this is the expected loss of the resolution. So we can color code this. Uh, some people find looking at the individual numbers uh, daunting, and here we're just color coding it and sort of categorizing the amount of loss that we're seeing. Where we have bright red means you're losing more than 80% of your single positive stain index. Uh, green means you're losing less than 20% uh, and in intermediate value. And in general, the rule would be that if you're in the red or the pink area, you're going to lose a lot of resolution. And you have to think about, are those the best color combinations for what you want to have? Now, on an individual panel, it's going to depend a little bit upon the antigen density and other factors, so you have to think about those at the same time. So here is a resolution impact matrix that said for a 12-color fax lyric. And you can see that most of it is green. We have some areas of red that are, are significantly uh, to be watched out for, in particular using the dye Brilliant Blue 700, which is a very, very bright dye, can cause a significant impact on APC and the, red, the other red dyes. Uh, BB786 uh, can uh, be affected by PE size 7. But this just gives you a very quick visual way of looking at any two dyes and asking, are they going to cause me problems or are they not going to cause me problems? So where can you get a resolution impact matrix? On the BD website, if you go under the applications and look at the guided panel uh, solution, the GPS, we have generic uh, uh, RIM matrices for most of our standard configurations on most of our instruments. And so you can use those. They are generic, so it means your instrument, depending on how you set up your instrument, might be a little bit different. But they, again, can be a tool that you can use. So we've talked about spillover and spread. We have an idea about how we can begin to quantify that and understand its potential impact. So let's use this information to improve panel design and learn how to troubleshoot our panels. So what is a well-designed panel? I, I, I get this question in, when talking to people about panel design, which is, well, how do I know if I have a good panel? What's good? What's optimal? Because we talk about optimal, but there really is no such thing as an absolute optimal panel. But what do we mean by optimal? The most important is I've identified X number of critical populations that are the biology that I'm trying to get out of that panel. Can I actually resolve each of those critical populations from all its neighboring populations? More importantly, if I'm doing a sorting experiment, can I easily draw gates for each of the populations identified in this assay? If the answer to both of these questions are yes, then basically you can consider this panel as optimal. Now, you might be able to get it better by changing some colors around and still improving the resolution. But if you can resolve them, then that's probably sufficient. If the answer to each of these questions is no, then you need to understand why it isn't performing as expected and to potentially do a second iteration. As you've heard from the previous lecture and from other lectures on panel design, Panel design is an iterative process. You're rarely ever going to get it right on the first time. So you have to understand why it didn't perform as expected. Was it the instrument? Was it the reagent? Was it the combination of reagents that you chose for your panel? Now the other thing to say is that 
Panel design, especially as you get into higher levels of multicolor, can be very tricky. And there may never be a perfect panel. In other words, you have to basically make decisions of, I have, let's just say in the simplest case, I have two critical populations. You might find that one combination of reagents will optimize the resolution of population one and sort of make population two a little bit worse. And the second combination may make population two better and make population one a little bit worse. In the perfect world, both would be equally good, but you may not get that. So then that's where you have to use your biological knowledge of what is more important for you in terms of your pattern design. So the mistake that we see most often for people doing pattern design is they start doing the corrections directly on the multicolor. So they, they put together their panel, they run their multicolor panel, and they look at it and go, this doesn't look right, and then they start making adjustments into their compensation to try and correct it. So this can be very, very dangerous. And I can speak from having done this for 20, 30 years, that you can make changes that in fact make your panel worse, even though you think you're making it better. In other words, data that appears wrong visually can have multiple causes, even for a highly trained eye, and the corrections that you make may complicate further and more accurate analysis. So I can't state this strong enough. So the time you spend in the early development of your assay using a step-by-step -step approach that we're going to talk about can save you enormous time down the road. Basically, as the commercial says, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. So what you want to do is to avoid redesigning the panel, for example, if the issues are due to something with the instrument. In other words, if it's a problem that you had with the instrument on that day, maybe the panel worked fine, but you know, you aren't getting good data because of the instrument, or the sample prep went wrong, or a particular reagent went wrong. So using the appropriate controls, the targeted approach that we're going to talk about will provide you with the necessary information and help redesign the panel if needed. So this is just an example I want to give you. We used this in the last webinar showing you a multicolor panel, and you can see lots of different interesting little populations that you might care about. But in this case, we know that, that there were compensation errors. We introduced them into the system. So in particular, if you look at the middle panel, the error, you see a population in blue coming off of a, a dim CD27 population, and it's gone when it's correctly compensated. But when I look at that, do I compensate uh, PE into APC? Is that what's causing that, comp that population to be pulled out? And the answer is no. The error there is coming from your 50 to PE compensation. So it can be, that's what I mean, it can be very difficult to understand by just looking at your multicolor population to understand where your error is coming from. Your knowledge of the rim panel and looking at who spills into who will give you some insight, but we'll talk about a, a better approach to that. So just in general, when looking for compensation errors, we talked about this last time a little bit, but the place to look for compensation errors is one, uh, single positive populations, things that are along the axis. So if you look at the upper right-hand panel, you can see that the population is being pulled off the axis. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the other place to look very often is on your negatives. When you see populations being pulled away from your negatives, that's often due to a compensation error. In general, bright double positives, it's almost impossible to inherently tell if they are or are not correctly compensated. So you're not going to be able to, to tell if something's a little bit more positive or a little bit more negative because of inappropriate compensation. So what do you need to do? Controls, controls, controls. In other words, in order to really correctly interpret data, you really need to run all the controls. And I know everybody wants to skip controls, especially when they're running experiments, because theoretically you could have a one-tube multicolor and you might have 16 different controls for that one tube. And you can't afford to do that on 100 different samples. But when you're developing the assay, 
I can't emphasize strongly enough the need to run all the different types of controls. So what type of controls are we talking about? First of all, unstained cells. Most people tend to forget about this, but it really is an amazingly powerful tool comparing unstained cells to stained cells to see where artifacts are being introduced. Secondly, you have two related types of controls, single stain controls. In other words, these are your actual reagents that you're going to use in the assay run as a single stain looking at how that looks on your population. Preferably, you want to be using the same types of cells and using the same cell prep at the assay. So if you're using, uh, doing intracellular, you want to do it in intracellular prep. And if you're doing uh, cells that have been stained, surface, and then intracellular, again, use that as your single stain control. Then you have classic compensation controls, which may be the same as your single stain control, or maybe a generic fluorochrome or uh, uh, loss specific controls. Then you have FMO controls, and we'll talk about those. Those are very powerful. And then biologic controls. These are not so much in terms of compensation, but in terms of your overall assay, you know, functional assay, stimulated versus unstimulated, you want to understand the impact of your, the biology that you're looking at. So as I said, these controls are critical when your assay is being optimized and for troubleshooting. All of these controls do not need to be run when you're actually running your assay. Some of them should be run always. Some of them should be run sometimes. So this is the process that we uh, put together. I'm only going to talk about uh, item number three and item number six, as those mainly relate to compensation. We have another webinar which we can uh, will provide, uh, which talks about taking you through this whole process. And if you notice that each step, we're using a different type of control or a different piece of information. So let's start with number three, just to make sure that we're assessing the compensation accuracy. We, have, we talked about this in the last webinar when we talked about compensation controls and having good compensation controls. But let's now see how we can use this to uh, correct and uh, deal with potential problems in an assay. So the first thing you want to do is, are your single stain controls correctly compensated? And this means checking your compensation and your single color controls, especially if they're different. So if they aren't, if they don't appear to be correctly compensated, one, did you follow the four principles that we talked about in the last assay, and have you used appropriate compensation controls? You want to quantify how much error is in each spillover value, and you can do that by just measuring how far off of the zero value you are. If you're really off significantly, you then want to go back and look at your compensation controls and see if maybe this reagent requires a lot specific control. If it's a little bit off, it may be due to biological variation. If you remember from the last webinar, we talked that even if you take the same reagent and stain 20 different samples from different individuals, you will see slightly different uh, spillover values for that, and that's just due to biological variation. And then if you've used beads versus cells, you have to check, did the beads give you accurate spillover values? So where appropriate, and you have reason to know that your spillover value was not set correctly, you can correct those spillover values and then apply those corrections to all of your multicolored tubes in your experiment. So here's an example where we're going to compare single stain and compensation controls. When we look at the single stain control, what we're seeing are two different uh, classic telltale signs of bad compensation, actually three. The first one is the population is below zero. If it's below zero, uh, it's just a guarantee that you have uh, some type of compensation error because the values should not be below zero. The other key here is that you can see, if you look at that, that it's on a diagonal. And diagonals, again, are classic signs of inappropriate or compensation that's not correct. Now, the diagonal can be either in the negative direction or can be in the positive direction. If you remembered in the slide we had before, we showed something that was off the diagonal, off the baseline, and it was in the positive direction, but it was still showing a diagonal. 
So these are classic signs that the compensation was not correct. Now, why is that? Well, let's look at the compensation control that we use. Well, what we can see is that clearly these are two different reagents. Uh, so the reagent that we use for doing the compensation control is not the same that we use for the single stain. I can guarantee you if you looked at the compensation control, you would see that the compensation looked perfect because the mathematics would do that. So what this suggests is, is that this reagent that we're seeing here that was in the single stain control probably uh, has some variation in the spillover, especially classically a tandem into its base. If you remember, we talked about last time, lots and lots of specific differences are typically from the tandem into the base. So BV700 is the tandem, BV421 is the base. So strong suggestion here is that you're going to need to use a lot specific uh, control. So let's now identify sources of spread, errors in spread, loss of resolution that you're seeing in your assay. So remember, even if you've done your compensation perfectly, you might still, in fact, will see a loss of resolution which can impact your assay. How do you identify that and how do you correct for it? So the first most important tool here is the FMO control. FMO stands for fluorescence minus one. Uh, this was originally developed by Mario Roeder many, many years ago. And it's one of the most powerful and useful tools when developing or evaluating a multicolor panel. Basically, it's uh, equivalent to the old isotype controls, but it's isotype controls on steroids. So the concept of an FMO is that you have all of the reagents in your full panel except for one. So here in this example, we're looking at uh, a six-color panel so if we look at the PERC-CP FMO, it has five of the reagents in and is missing the PERC-CP Psi 5.5 reagent. Now what I'm going to talk about is that, and this, so theoretically if you have an 18 color experiment, you would want to run 18 different FMOs. That can be painful, and it's certainly not something you're going to be able to do every time you run your experiment. So what I'm going to tell you is that there are going to be FMOs that you're, you should probably run almost all of your FMOs when you're designing your panel and evaluating and going through your iterations. But from that data, you're going to understand that probably of that, you may only need two or three FMOs to correctly analyze your data and determine what's positive and what's negative. And in that point, and we talked about this in the last webinar, determining which controls are necessary for an assay is in fact part of assay development. So we're going to use an example here. It's a very simple example that we've used for many years, and I like it because since it is simple, it's easy to see uh, where the, the issues lie and how to correct them. If you get into you know, 18, 19 colors, the principles are absolutely identical, 100% identical, but trying to show you in a teaching environment can be very difficult. So we talk about three different levels. The first one is the uh, what we call the no rules or I get the reagents from the refrigerator. Basically, you use whatever reagents. So you aren't paying attention to fluorochrome brightness or antigen density. The second set is what I see in, when I see people teaching panel design, they go to the second example and then they stop. But the second example is basically fairly logical. I want to put bright fluorochrome on dimly expressed antigens and dim fluorochrome on brightly expressed antigens. And you can see that in this example here using that panel. The first example is I just pulled things out of the refrigerator. I have reagents to all of these markers, but what you can see is the resolution isn't terribly good. In fact, some populations aren't even being resolved very well. I care about uh, my Treg populations, which are CD127 and uh, 25 positive, but again, you can see them here, but not well resolved in the context of the whole population. So in the second example, so for example here, I put 50 on CD127. 127 in the context of what we care about, it's a very dim marker. Therefore, I'm using a dim fluorochrome on a dim marker. Not a good thing. I'm using PE on CD4. 
PE is very bright, CD4 is highly expressed. If I have any spillover issues, I'm going to intensify those problems by th that choice. So in here, I've made a number of very bad choices, as indicated by the, the red exclamation point. In the second example, I've tried to follow the rules of always putting something uh, bright, uh, highly expressed on a dim marker and vice versa. So you can see here we have CD3 on 50. We put the CD25 on PE. CD4 on another dim marker per CP Psi 5.5. CD8 on APC Psi 7, also dim. Uh, so I think you can see easily here that we have significantly improved uh, the, the look of the population. I've lost resolution of CD4. Do I care? No. Can I still resolve the population? Yes. So that's why you're doing a trade-off of a population you don't care about. You're lowering in the resolution so you can improve your resolution somewhere else. And where have I improved the resolution? Well, I've improved it dramatically in terms of PE, both in terms of spread and in terms of brightness. And I've now improved the resolution of seeing where there was one population, I can now see two. And I've got a little bit better resolution of the uh, T-reg population, which are the CD25 bright, CD127 dull. But it still doesn't look great to me. And the reason I say it doesn't look great is if you go here, is in either one of these, can I say cleanly where I would put the gate for the T-reg population? And I would argue it's okay, but it's not great. So can we take this from a okay to a great uh, population, a great panel? So now we want to talk about uh, best practices in panel design. And this is where we're now going to use all the information we've been talking about in the first webinar and up to now in this webinar. Because what we want to do is to optimize and focus our interest on the, on the critical population. And what we want to do is we want to minimize loss of resolution due to spread uh, from the fluorescent spillover of co-expressed antigen. So that's the first important point. You're going to focus on, one, your population of interest, and two, on those antigens which are expressed on those populations of, of interest. And you're going to want to minimize the spectral spillover. So when the antigens are co-expressed, avoid significant spillover of a bright marker into a dim marker because you're going to get more spread. When you can spread the antigens across multiple lasers, that will usually decrease the amount of spillover, although there are uh, and uh, fluorochromes that have uh, multiple laser excitation, and that can still cause you problems. One thing I want to make a point, and this is something I keep hearing from people, which is, oh, I can't use these two dyes together in my panel. And the answer is no. You can use, as far as I can conceive of, virtually any two dyes, as long as they aren't actually measured in the exact same detector. Any two dyes you can use in a panel, you just have to be careful where you use them. And this is a perfect example. What I've done is I combined data from two different uh, CD4 files. But what you can see, as we uh, saw on the other, PE Psi 5 and APC basically have virtually the exact same emission spectra. PE Psi 5 being excited off the blue laser, PE, uh, APC being excited off the red laser. But what you can see here, if you look at the red population, it has a tremendous amount of spread. It's going all the way out to 10 to the fourth. So you'd never be able to resolve another population that was also CD4 from that. But if I put the CD4, uh, if I put the APC for the other detector, I can resolve those two populations just perfectly. There's no problem. So this is the concept of if you have dyes that have a high, high level of uh, fluorescent spillover, you want to put them on populations, on markers that are not co-expressed. I call them orthogonal populations. So basically, CD4 and CD8 would be classic orthogonal populations. CD3 and CD19 would be classic orthogonal populations. And for those two markers, you can put anything you want, and it'll still work. So let's sort of go through a, a thought diagram of how one would think about generating 
uh, and selecting markers and antigens and fluorochromes for those markers. So the first question you have, you have two markers. One, are they co-expressed? As I just showed you, if they're not co-expressed, you basically don't have to worry about spillover spread. Basically, at that point, just assign the fluorochromes based upon the antigen density. If one of them is a brightly dense, use a dim fluorochrome and vice versa. However, if they are co-expressed on a population that you care about, then you have more decisions to make. First one is, what is the relative, relative expression of A and B? Either, they'll either be the same or A will be greater than B or B will be greater than A. Let's just take the example of A being greater than B. At this point, you need to choose your reagent. For B, since it's a, presumably a dimmer expressed antigen, you're going to want to use a bright fluorochrome. And at one, you want to use one that has a minimal loss of the A, B, of the a positive, B positive population. In other words, you want the minimum spillover of the B fluorochrome into A. And vice versa, for A, you want to use the dim fluorochrome again. It's not as important, but you want to minimize the loss of the resolution of the A positive, B positive. So now this makes you think back to when we were talking about the double positive stain index and the loss of resolution. As I said earlier, this is an iterative process. So you now have chosen your reagents, you run your assay, and you look and you go, did I get good resolution? If you did, great success. You've now achieved your, your assay. If you didn't, you now need to go back and choose your reagents. But you want to wisely choose. You want to understand why did my markers, why did the reagents that I chose not give me the results I wanted? And that's where you can really begin to up your game in terms of pattern design. Some of this will become instinctive when you've done this for years and years. You think about this instinctively. But what we've been trying to do is provide you tools to help people who have less experience in this field. So to assess panel compensation accuracy, assume you've, you've done all the corrections at your single color level. You've done the best compensation you can from your controls. And what you want to do is to set up a template, in your, an assay template, where basically where you're looking at everything against everything. If you have six colors, you want to look at every six colors by every other, so that's six factorial number of plots. This can get quite, uh, quite large. You're going to assume that all the possible corrections based upon your single stain and compensations have been made and applied to the experiment. What are you going to look for? You're going to, uh, first of all, spend time adjusting your bi-exponential so things are on scale. You're going to use your knowledge of the biology to look for populations with unexpected phenotypes. In other words, if you say the population of CD4 cells and they're expressing a significant amount of CD8, probably, not always, but probably you have a problem with compensation. Again, if the compensation is slightly off, go back and make sure your controls are correct. If it's significantly off, there's some other factors that can play, and we'll talk about those now. The first one that's the most common that we see now is with the introduction of the serogen uh, polymer dyes. They have some characteristics which, with not attended uh, to correctly, can cause problems. And that is there is something called dye-dye interactions where the dyes will actually stick to each other. So here we see an action, uh, some samples, where we're looking at uh, CD4 and CD8 and, and CD4 versus CD19. And what you can see here is exactly what I talked about. You have a population that looks like it's CD4 positive and, and CD8. You also have the same population that looks like it's CD19 positive. Highly unlikely. This is due to dye-dye interaction. So what we have is we provided a what we call brilliant stain buffer. You add that to your reagents, to your panel, and that effectively minimizes this interaction. So Always make sure if you're ever using more than one brilliant stain buffer, a brilliant stain dye, either whether it's a, a BV, a, a BUV, anything of, the, of that nature, you always want to add brilliant stain buffer into your samples. And then there are the, oops, then there are the uh, anecdotal problems. And these I just call idiotypic interactions, idiotypic being that they're unique to a certain set of dyes, a certain set of reagents. They're not the result of dye-dye interaction, but 
if you look at enough of the hundreds and thousands of different reagents that are available, you will find certain reagents that interact with each other. And we do not know why these actually. In some cases, we've spent literally months looking at it, and we've not been able to understand why these interactions occur. This is one example that we found. So here we're looking at APC H7, CD8 with uh, CCR7, PECF594. And what we can see is the population that's off axis. You can see it's sort of at a diagonal, and it's off axis. And from biology, we know that that should be uh, on axis. If we use a different uh, reagent, PE Psi7 instead of PE uh, instead of uh, APC Psi7, now everything looks normal. Or if we convert this to BV421, again, it looks normal. We can see the same population. We've studied this, and we have no reason to know why these two don't work together. So sometimes, if you see something like that, you can call our tech services, and they may be able to help you and go, yep, we've seen this. Uh, and sometimes, if you see a problem and all your controls are correct, you need to make another choice. So having talked about this, we've talked about making adjustments to your multicolor panel. I just want to give one warning, and that is when you make adjustments to your spillover values based upon your multicolor tubes, you are in effect overriding the information from your control tubes. And you're saying that you don't believe the data from your control tubes. And there might be reasons for that. Again, donor-donor variation, some other factors. But just be very, very careful because you are assuming that you know which populations are present and how they should look phenotypically. And it's possible that you're affecting the phenotype of a real unexpected population. I, I can tell you in the early days of B cells, CD5 was never, ever, ever seen on B cells. And then a discovery was made and people saw some CD5 positive B cells. And initially they assumed that the, there was an error in the compensation and they tried to eliminate the CD5. That was a real population. And especially if you're looking at clinical samples. And, and with leukemias and lymphomas, often they have unexpected phenotypes, which you may not know what that phenotype is. So I'm just saying be very careful. And what I would highly recommend is that if the source of compensation cannot be identified, make a copy of that uh, tube and then make the adjustments on the copy not on the original. That way you'll always have the original data and know exactly what that spillover value is. So let's talk about identifying, in a multicolor panel, let's talk about identifying problems with spillover and spread. And we talked about this a little bit last time, but I want to reemphasize something. So if you're looking at a full panel and you see this population here, which is the CD25 bright, CD127 dim population, you want to look for populations that have significant numbers of events below zero. Typically, they will be very diffuse and spread out. And this is typically due to A, overcompensation, which can cause things to go below zero, or very large spread, which uh, is due to the spillover. If you remember the very first slide of this presentation, we showed you a spillover of uh, PE into PECF, and it went from minus uh, 3,500 to positive 3,500. That's a lot of spillover. The compensation can be exactly correct. Go back and look at that slide and you'll see that the compensation is exactly correct and yet you're going to have negative numbers. That means a lot of spillover. So in this example here, this data is suggesting that we're getting a lot of spread into the PE site 7 detector. So then the question is, where is that coming from? Because we just don't want to start randomly changing your assay into something new, it may get worse. And this is where the information we've been talking about uh, comes into a factor. So if we look at this, and we're looking at PE site 7, we can go back to the REM table and ask, where was that problem? But what we know and what we can see here is that PE site 7, let's go and look. The primary floor, floor is PE site 7. Let's look across that row. And what we can see is that PERSI P-Cypy from 5 is red. 
That means per CP Psi 5.5 is going to have a lot of spread into the PE Psi 7. And now we know that the per CP Psi 5.5, if we look at the panel, was on CD4. We know that our Treg cells are CD4 positive. Therefore, it's highly likely that it's the per CP Psi 5.5 CD4 that is causing us our problem in the CD127. Excuse me. So one way of looking at that is to again compare our single stain control that we had to the multicolor stain. And what you can see here is that the single stain control, this is a different, uh, a different experiment, but we're looking at uh, Alexa Fluor 700 interfering gamma, and we look at the single stain control, relatively tight, we can see a nice population of positives, but in the multicolor sample, it's now very spread out. And again, that tells us that something in our multicolor tube is causing a massive amount of spread in that detector. So this is where the FMO comes in. So we'll go into this more detail, but the FMO here is because it was Alexa Floor 700, if we go back to our rim table, we'll see what colors can significantly impact uh, Alexa, Alexa Floor 700, and one of the major ones is BV711. So now what we're doing is looking at the multicolor tube with everything except the BV711. And what you can see is now your Alexa Floor 700 looks very much like your single stove stain control. So that's telling you that the problem you've got with the uh, BV, uh, with the Alexa Floor 700 is coming from your B BV 711. So now you can proactively go back and try and change that to make a better panel. So here, again, is another example, the same using the FMO control. We suspected that the PE Psi 7 problem was coming from the uh, per CP 5.5 CD4. So in the upper panels, we're looking at the full panel, the full assay, and the FMO, we've taken out the CD4, and what you can see immediately is that we've tightened up that Treg population. It's tighter, it's clustered, it's not spread out as much, and there's very little below the background. So that says, if we can put something else in the CD4, that will probably help our resolution of the Treg population. So let's go back to the rim table. As I said, we looked at here, we said PE size 7 really is impacted horribly by the per CP. You're going to have to make some choices. So how about if we take the per CP and put it on CD8? The T reg cells do not express CD8, therefore the per CP is not going to cause us any problem. We can then make other changes. We can take the uh, CD8, put CD4 on APC87. APC87 is not going to affect the PE size 7 very much, it's dim. We can take the PE, leave it the same. Take the APC, we'll essentially convert it, uh, use it on the CD127, now using uh, uh, Alexa Floor 647 because we don't have that in APC. And then we can take the other ones and change the other ones. So now we have a new panel, and what have we done? We've now switched the uh, interaction for the CD127 from the red, which was the intersection of the PE Psi 7 and per CP Psi 5.5, and now we have it down to an orange, which is the intersection of APC and APC 87. And that will make a significant difference, and let's see what type of difference it does make in reality when we now go back and look at the data. And the top panel, we did not take into account spillover and spread. We sort of saw the population. You can see in the upper left. But now look at the population of the Treg cells in the bottom left. That is now a tight population, easily resolvable from the other populations. You can draw an easy gate around that, and you don't have a lot of negative cells. So, 
if you think of the progression that we've done here, we've taken a panel that looked pretty bad by just throwing some reagents at it. We took the concepts of using bright reagents with dim markers and, and dim reagents with bright markers. We got to the second example, significantly improved, but in terms of the population we cared about, not great. And then the third example, we used all the knowledge we had and the metrics of understanding spillover and spread to tighten that population because that's the population we care about. We actually have a little bit less of resolution of some of the other detectors, but we don't care about that. So what I'd like to take you next is we've been teaching these principles for a number of years. For those of you who have attended our Horizon uh, tour, the early ones, uh, version one and version two, this will all look familiar to you. If you want to get a little bit more in depth on this, you can go back and look at this, uh, those lectures. But I now want to take you to a tool that we've now made available in the last year, year or two, and this is GPS or the Guided Panel Solution. This is an online tool to support your development of multicolor athletes. Now, I want to be very clear at the beginning. This tool does not tell you which reagents to use. What we're doing is we're giving you some guidance more as to which reagents not to use together. So again, if you go back to the BD website that I talked about here where you have GPS, this will take you into the GPS software. The first tab will let you list all of your panels and you can edit them, delete them, and make any modifications you want. And then it, what it's doing is taking you through a step-by-step -step guidance of all the principles we've been teaching you and lets you put together the information that you need to make good decisions about your panel. So the first thing you need to know is, well, what are the markers I'm going to have in my assay? And these are the same markers we showed earlier that we're using for the T. reg population. It lets you tell about what type of antigens are. Are they primary antigens, secondary, tertiary, based upon the, the uh, rotor designation? And if you want to, you can even specify what clone you want to use. The next thing, what do you do when you're designing an assay? You have your markers, and then you start thinking about what are the populations I want to define using these markers. And the tool uh, provides you a population tree so that you can then create your own uh, gating strategy on your population. And as you define your populations you are looking at, as you can see, you can run, if you have a 12-color experiment, you might have 25 different populations, but you only care about two or three. And the software then lets you designate the ones that are in blue. We've designated these are populations that we care about. These are what we call a critical population. And in the left-hand panel, it lets you say exactly what is the expression level. You can get this from uh, previous uh, articles in the literature, from uh, general knowledge. Everybody knows CD4 is highly expressed, CD8 is highly expressed, and CD25 in general is dimly expressed. So use that information to fill this out, and this information will then be used later. Then the next thing you need to know when you're running an assay is, what instrument am I going to run it on? Am I going to run it on a two-laser instrument, a three-laser instrument, a five-laser instrument? How many detectors will I have? What fluorochrome? So this next uh, tab will show you, you can select whatever instrument you want, and then you can select the configuration of that instrument for any BD instrument. If you want, you can create your own instrument by just adding in the filters and the lasers that you want. So uh, you have also on this slide, let me see if I have it here. Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Hang on a second. So what it does is once you've now put all this information in, you can see in the upper area you have the critical populations to define. In this one it was Treg and activated Treg. It shows you what co-expressed markers are there and the expression level. So you can now use this information to already choose what you want to do. And again, what I say is the, the software at this point does not tell you what reagents to choose, but it tells you where you might have problems. And you can always override the software and say, this is what I want. But if you notice here, uh, 
whenever you see a, the red exclamation point, it's saying that you have a mismatch. It's saying you've put a bright fluorochrome on a, bright, on a highly expressed antigen or vice versa. So again, you can then deselect that and make another choice. So in this example, we've now made the correction. So if you notice, there are no red exclamation points. So we've effectively gone to the second level of panel design. But now we need to understand about spillover and spread. So this is where the tool of RIM comes in, in that the analyze resolution impact is going to then help you identify problematic reagent combinations which could have a significant impact on critical populations. So here, it's analyzed this assay, and it's saying you have per CP sci-5.5 on CD4. That's a very bright antigen, and we know that per CP sci-5.5 spills a lot, i.e. greater than 80%, into PE sci-7 on a dim antigen, which is CD127. So it is automatically giving you the information of where you have some problems. So before we took you through the mental process, but here this is being done automatically for you. Once you've got this information, you now need to think about redesigning your assay. But again, the help is there because you can now view the resolution impact and it will show you exactly what the resolution impact is uh, for that instrument uh, with those fluorochromes. And you can see we're at the red right now, and then you can choose, as we did before, to change your, your colors around. So in GPS, we've now introduced a new process by which you can create a rim specific for your cytometer. And this is a very, very powerful tool. So if you're on the Choose Cytometer tab, you'll see two buttons, one, View, and if you do that, you will see the generic RIM that we provide you for common configurations and common fluorochromes, but it may not match your configuration and it may not match the fluorochromes that you're using. The Create RIM will allow you to create your own custom RIM from data that you collect. The instructions for doing this are embedded within the software. So, BD provides what we call the CD4 fluorochrome evaluation kit. And what you can see is that we have one for the mouse and one for the human. And you can see that we have small samples of CD4 in every single color that we provide. So what that means, you can now do a rim kit because to create the rim, what you need to do is measure CD4 expression on every color, and then mathematically it creates the rim doing the calculations I showed you earlier. This is all behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about the math. You don't have to worry about anything about that other than collecting the data. So, in summary, when you think about panel design and anal analyzing it, when designing an assay to get to an optimal color, multicolor panel, you will often have to go through two or more iterations. The tools we have, like the RIM and the GPS, those are designed to help you minimize the number of iterations you need to go through, but I will guarantee you, you will always go through a couple of iterations, unless you get really lucky. When you're evaluating the assay, it's going to be important to distinguish between problems that are associated with the overall assay design and the execution, i.e. the setup, performance, reagent performance, and the design of the panel itself, in other words, the reagents you chose. And that's what you want to try and do to minimize the number of iterations. So with this information, I believe you will be better prepared to develop your own assays and do it effectively, economically, and in terms of time. I will say that this, we talked about the third level. There is still a fourth level of uh, pattern design that one needs to think about that we won't cover in this webinar, and that is understanding the biology. So when you're dealing with say, samples that do have abnormal populations that may be very brightly expressed or dimly expressed, that can change how you analyze your, your panel. Individual reagents can show characteristics that are uh, outside the norm. So again, there are going to be many other characteristics that you have to think about when you're doing your panels. But with this, 
you should be able to reduce your panel design with one or two uh, iterations less than what you did before. Now, I hope this gives you a better understanding of compensation, spread, resolution, and how you can use all of this information to better identify and better characterize the population in your assay so that you can get better biological results. And with that, I thank you, and, and we'll take questions. Thank you, Alan. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, so we have actually some really great questions coming in in our Q&A session. So, um, you know, this, you give this really interesting talk on spread and spillover. Um, would you mind just clarifying what spread is and why do we always see that spread in the negative? Well, the spread is coming from the fact in, in the last lecture, if you remember, when you were adding a fluorochrome, it's adding uh, MFIs, and those MFIs will have a, a standard deviation associated with it. So that's inherent in the, the fact that you've stained these cells appropriately. And the spread is actually in uh, the, use, is in the positive population, but when I say to look at the negative, so for example, if I have a spread of uh, 50 into PE, but if I'm now looking at, and let's say I have it overcompensated, so that the PE, uh, uh, the 50 positives will now look to be PE negative. When I'm looking at another combination of colors of uh, PE versus some other fluorochrome, the cells are going to look like they're negative for PE, even though they aren't, uh, and that's due to the spread coming from another detector. And that's why it can be hard to uh, necessarily identify it just by looking at your multicolor panel. So how should we go about, you know, decreasing that spread if spread is such a problem on resolution? Um, we talk a little bit about that voltage, and, you know, we do change voltages a lot just to correct some of those spillover values. Um, what about changing voltage in these, the detector that a particular fluorochrome is spreading into? Uh, would that um, help alleviate some of those spread issues? No, it won't. It, it'll change the numbers a little bit, but the, the spread, it, it's a mathematical reality. You can't get away from it. So as we showed, you know, by changing the, the PMT voltage in, in one direction, you can change the spillover values, and you aren't changing the spread. If you change it in the other direction, you'll have an apparent change in the spread because of the way the numbers are being calculated, but your absolute spread will, will stay the same because you'll be taking things off the negative. So unfortunately, how do we deal with it? Um, the, the, the main thing is as to what we've been talking about, and that is to wisely choose your reagents. As I point out, it doesn't matter about the spread as long as the uh, markers are on orthogonal populations, CD3 versus CD19, that type of thing, CD4 versus CD8. And the whole, uh, concept that we've been trying to put out here is that by wisely choosing uh, your markers so that you minimize the spread of those markers that you care about, that's, that's how you optimize your flow cytometry. So how do we use that double stain index? Because that does give us a lot of information on our fluorochromes and how that works with our instrument. How, do you, how can we use some of the biology knowledge to help make that really good panel by utilizing the double stain index? The double stain index, so first of all, please remember that these are, if you will, and I, want, I want to say artificial numbers, but these are numbers based upon all antigen densities being equal. So they give you a, an idea that's focusing mainly on the fluorochrome and not focusing on the antigen density. So, but the way you can use that is that, so if you think about, uh, Let's talk about spillover of, of PE into FIPC. Uh, that is going to have a certain impact on, that, uh, on any information you get out of that detector. But if you're using FIPC in that detector, the spread impact on the FIPC is going to be more uh, of a negative problem than spread impact on, say, uh, BB515, 
which is five to ten times brighter than 50. So what the stain index is doing is giving you an absolute value of the relative resolution you're going to get using any two reagents of equivalent brightness. Uh, I didn't cover it here, and I can I can post it in the answers. You can actually use the information, if you know the relative density of the antigens, you can actually calculate a true double positive stain index for any two antigens, uh, co-express antigens in your population. So when you have those, um, the double stain index, is there a way I should look at um, how I should position a primary um, marker versus a secondary marker or um, antigen that's highly expressed or versus an antigen that is not as highly expressed? So basically what you want to do is to, using the, the, the RIM and the double positive stain index uh, table together, the rim is going to give you an idea of how much this combination of reagents for these two markers is going to have an impact. But the double positive stain index literally lets you know how much stain index you still have. If you look at the table, you'll see in some cases you go from 700 down to 70. So you really have very little stain index left. You, you decrease the resolution. So you have to combine that knowledge with the knowledge of the bright antigen and the dim antigen. Because remember, we talked in the first lecture, that the amount of the spread that you have is going to be proportional to the amount of spillover by the intensity, the brightness of the marker that you're looking at. So if think of it this way. If my uh, spread is... Uh, you know, 400 at 10 to, uh, uh, 10 to the fourth, down at 10 to the uh, third, it's going to be much, much less. It's going to be maybe uh, 200 uh, or 150. I don't have the exact math calculated, but basically the amount of spread is going to be proportional to how bright. So one of the tricks you can do is if you have a, an assay and you've used all your markers up and you, you've gotten where you can, but you're still getting a lot of spread from a given marker, if you have to, uh, it, this is a last resort, but if you have to, you can theoretically uh, dim that marker either by adding unlabeled antibody or just by titrating it down, and that will minimize the amount of spread. Thank you, Alan. Well, um, you also gave some really great insight to how to evaluate our multicolor panels. And as we learned from you in the past two webinars, we, you know, there's um, reagents, there's spillover issues, there are spread issues that we must consider. So evaluating those panels and having the right controls are important. So um, some of the questions are asking about the right way of processing those samples and generating the right controls. Now, if I'm looking at, let's say, an activation panel, when I'm generating the controls for assessing my panel, should I use an activated sample or something that is a negative a norm or a normal control? Uh, in one sense, early on, doing both will be of useful information. But in the final analysis, you want to use as close to the actual assay. The reason I say this, for example, uh, there are, well, CD4, for example, when you uh, stimulate uh, CD4 cells and activate them, you often get down regulation of CD4. So if you were to create the assay making the assumption that the CD4 level was going to be what you see in uh, normal uh, lymphocytes, and you've now down regulated it tenfold, you might have to rethink which antigen. So what was a bright, would be considered a high density antigen, now becomes a medium density or a low density. And in certain leukemias and lymphomas, you can get uh, extreme upregulation or downregulation of good markers. So when you're thinking about your assay, you really do have to think about the biology of the samples you're using. And this can become very difficult if you are using experimental conditions that will cause a high fluctuation of uh, antigen density. So for example, if you have a marker that is going to be uh, highly uh, uh, variable uh, expression level, you're probably going to want to have a bright antigen on it 
a bright, excuse me, a bright fluorochrome because you're going to want to resolve it when it becomes very dim. But similarly, you're probably going to want to have that fluorochrome have very little spillover into other markers because if it becomes very bright, then that spillover is going to damage your uh, resolution in the other markers. So in these cases, would you still recommend when I generate comp controls to use beads or cells or maybe a combination of both? This is what I hit upon last time a little bit and I emphasized here again. Part of the process of creating your assay is really understanding what controls you need to run for, for that assay. So yes, definitely you, you, you want to use the type of, of staining that you're doing. You want to use those. It's hard to give a very absolute specific answer because the controls you use are going to be dependent upon the type of assay you have. And again, you used an example, and again, can you, can you re repeat the example that you used? In terms of um, activation markers, um, if I'm looking for something that is um, activation, um, activated versus something that is um, not activated, what kind of controls would right. I use, even in generation compensation controls? And if you remember in the, on the slide that we talked about controls, one of those was what we call biological controls. Mm -hmm. So you'd like to understand what is the biology that you're doing, what is the biological process, how is that impacting your, your, flora, your, your antigen density. So yes, you would want to run an activated sample because you'd want to see mm -hmm. what the antigen expression is like under those conditions, but by running a normal control, you'll then actually see that the activation is what is causing that problem. So it may cause an upregulation. In many cases, activation causes increase in autofluorescence, so that's something that has to be taken into account. Definitely with intracellular uh, staining, what we know is you, get, you can get two phenomena. One is that very often you can get significantly higher backgrounds, which will lower your resolution. So again, if you have high background, you're going to want to make sure you're using a, a brightest fluorochrome as possible. And the other thing is, is that uh, often fixation, if, you, if some people do staining where they stain the cell surface and then fix and then stain intracellular, well, staining the, uh, fixating the uh, fluorochromes can have an impact on their brightness. Or if you uh, fix before you stain, fixing can have a bright, uh, an impact on the antigen density expression. It can affect the epitopes. So you really do have to, part of the process, there are no, sadly, well not sadly, but the art of flow cytometry is there are no absolute hard and fast rules. And so it is incumbent early on that you understand your system and understand the variables in your system. And you brought up a very good point about autofluorescence. Now, will autofluorescence affect how we look at spread? No. I mean, autofluorescence will, will – the more autofluorescence, you're going to get a, a broader population in the negatives. But autofluorescence itself will not, uh, will not affect the spread in general because the spread is going to be so much larger than the autofluorescence, although in extreme cases, the autofluorescence can become a factor. So um, yes, definitely a lot of the cell prep and the, in, the innate properties of the cell will affect how we look at that panel. Now what about um, these brilliant dyes? I mean, we talk about brilliant violet dyes a lot, and you also you know, mentioned the brilliant stain buffer. Uh, why do we have to use the brilliant um, stain buffer in a lot of these cases? It comes from the fact that we, you know, this is a totally different type of chemistry for these dyes. And early on, we identified that they did have these uh, non-specific non, uh, non dye-dye interactions, which causes things to look as if they are being uh, undercompensated. But we specifically developed the brilliant stain buffer such that when you add that to your, your stain, those problems go away. So it's one of those things, it's, a, it's a, uh, an effect of uh, the dyes. It's a little bit like Early on, uh, when people started using PE Sci-5, they found that we got uh, tremendous background on monocytes and some B cells, 
and it turned out that PE Psi 5 not specifically binds to FC receptors. So uh, reagents were developed, FC block and other reagents were developed to prevent that. So when we develop new dyes, we understand the characteristics of those dyes and then provide those uh, reagents or additives needed to make those dyes work correctly in an assay. And, at the, and you did also mention the GPS at the end. Um, so one, one question that did come up is the viability stains. We used a lot of viability stains in many panels just to clean up some of the dead cells. Will the viability stains be incorporated into the GPS? We haven't incorporated them yet. Uh, they, they will be in a future version. Viability stains are, uh, one, you, you can incorporate it in the sense that you have the ability to introduce a viability stain in the list of the antigen uh, markers, and then it has brightness in there. But the viability stains are, we don't have relative spillover values for viability stains. But they are also different in that, by definition, the, the viability stain are only positive on the dead cells. Therefore, you are deleting out the dead cells. Therefore, any cells that are negative for your viability stain will not spill into anything else. So you really do not have to worry significantly about viability stains spilling into anything else. You do have to worry about other dyes spilling into the viability uh, stain detector, but that is covered by your standard uh, compensation controls. Thank you, Alan. You know, this has been extremely helpful in helping us understand spread. I think we see that in a lot of our data, but without understanding what it is. So um, thank you so much. I think this is all the questions that we have. Um, and thank you for your time. We're looking forward again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for all for attending. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. We hope you found this webcast presentation informative. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.